discussion from where we left off last time, which had to do with, um, you know, basically putting together the objects that you need to run the analysis. But then I also wanted to talk about um, the idea of effect in a um, stochastic actor model and give you some examples of those and talk about how to think about them and stuff like that. I, I, you're, you're muted right now, Len. That, that, that'd be great, John. Okay. Be um, so, okay. Um, well, it's uh, 902. Why don't we hit the road here? All right. So for phase two of our uh, discussion of um, specifying and estimating stochastic actor models, um, last time we uh, just got to the point of talk. I'm going to share my screen here so everybody can see it. No, that's not what I want. That's better. Okay. And um, there's the share. And everybody should now be able to see my R Studio uh, windows, right? Okay, I see. I see happy nods, which is a good thing. Um, okay, so where we started, where we left off last time, um, was uh, we we had just to recap. We had gone through the, the setup process. Uh, in which you can kind of see the steps over here. Uh, one of the nice things about our studio is that if you use this um, uh, our markdown in the, in the, uh, the script, you get a nice little outline over here. So like the number of um, cross hatches indicates how far it indents. And uh, that's a really handy thing for finding your way around a script. Uh, but anyway, um, so we will just remind ourselves, uh, load all of our packages, which I'm going to do by just running this code chunk here. I will mention parenthetically that um, I use uh, what are called um, uh, RStudio notebooks, which are basically, they're like scripts, except that you can create these chunks and run them individually. I mean, you can really do the same thing in a plain old R script, um, except that you have to highlight the code that you want to run and then press a run button of some kind. So this just saves you the step of the highlighting if you've organized the chunks in a way that make logical sense. So for example, this chunk has the function of um, uh, loading the package and setting the working directory. Oh, Ted, by the way, um, remember last time we had a problem with the working directory uh, when we were uh, trying to get this uh, set up on your computer? The problem was that the working directory can get saved into the um, worksheet or into the uh, workspace. And um, in fact, it's almost impossible to avoid that. Uh, because usually you do want it loaded into the workspace since anytime you want to write code to reference something in your repository, that code needs to know what it's looking at. And so you need to have some nice easy reference to, you know, this uh, directory over here. So what I did was I just changed this little chunk here so that it always reloads the working directory just in case somehow or another you loaded let's say, uh, the workspace from, that you just imported from um, GitHub. And it happened to have, for example, my version of working dir in it, all right? So this resets it to yours. And then after the load, just to make doubly sure, it loads it again, just in case, in other words, this particular repository here compared contained a different working dir specification. So that solves the problem. And so anybody should be able to now use this code uh, without modification. I think I sent everybody an email about this yesterday that contained that information. It also contained a bunch of stuff, by the way, about um, how I would like you to use uh, the repo. Mainly, don't mess with the um, code bases that we're sharing in master and RCNA setup but create your own branches and you can do anything you want with it. 
and everything's cool then if you do that. And that's a great way to share that work with other people when and if you need to. So, um, I like the Spider-Man reference. Well, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. We don't have to say any more than that because everybody's seen that. Um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and load the working directory or load the uh, workspace right now. So I'll probably need that. Grinding away. I want to reiterate that if you haven't read that email of mine, please do. It's very important. You know, if we don't adhere to those standards or something like that, we're, we're going to get ourselves caught up in our underwear quicker than you can say, Bob's your uncle. All right. So we went through all of this stuff yesterday and ended up um, right here, where the <clears throat> Sienna specific objects that we created, uh, this Fnet zero SD, remember, is a network object with structural zeros in it. Um, and um, the recovery factor, RF, is a endogenous behavior variable. RS.sex, RS.age, and RS. In res L are respectively sex, age, and um, time in residence at first survey, uh, and they're fixed covariates, that is, they don't vary in time. And then finally, CCSD is the uh, composition change object, which tells RCN of when people arrived in the network and when they left. Um, so this data object is. Uh, formatted in a way that, that RCNA can deal with. Um, anytime you write an app, obviously, you need to make some decisions about uh, what kind of, what format the data has to be in for your app to, uh, to deal with it. And it can't be just any old thing because then you'd spend all your time writing front ends for looking at data. Um, so <clears throat> ultimately, this is the format that the data takes. And um, I should add too <clears throat> that your modeling can only include effects associated with these variables here. All right. So this is the point where you're really making the decision about broadly speaking, what the variables can be in your model. Now, on the other hand, if you've made other, you know, RCN and data objects, like you could have had a, a behavior variable like uh, self-esteem that varies over time. You could have had a behavior variable like, um, um, I, I don't know, quality of life, which varies over time. And you could have had um, a, varia, a variable like ethnicity, which doesn't vary over time. Uh, and maybe you just didn't include them in this data object. Well, that's fine. You know, that's no problem. You can just go make another data object uh, if you wanted to, to create a model that has those other variables in it. Um, so basically, unlike a sort of an ordinary regression, let's say in SPSS, where you've, you know, you've got a data file, the data file has variables, you just call on those variables when you need them, right? In this case, you have this intermediate step where you have to select the variables and stick them into a, a specifically formatted data object, as we do here. Um, by the way, this function, CN data create, uh, like the other functions that made these guys here, is uh, a function in RCNA. So John, since we have findings of African Americans seeming to do better mm -hmm. in recovery homes, right. I'm wondering whether we should be putting the ethnicity factor in there too. Um, Abs absolutely we should. Um, and I mean, that's a really good point. Uh, but the thing is that with Stochastic actor models, because of the fact that the models take a long time to estimate, um, hours usually take somewhere around an hour or two. So it's not like you just press a button and boom, you get a result. Um, and so we'd like to start out with the simplest possible models and build them up. And right now we're still in that process, basically. But point well taken, um, we do know that, that um, uh, ethnicity is, is an important uh, moderator, apparently of a lot of these effects. And um, 
that's something that we will definitely be exploring in future models. So thanks, Len. Um, okay, so I think I mentioned um, this before, but that's a little review. Um, you can also get a descriptive data report by using this print01 report function, again, from the RCNA package that refers to the data object you just created. And this name here will be the name of a text file that gets created over here in your repository. And that's always a good idea to look at because if there's something fishy with the data, you know, the, this will show you basically all of the uh, information about, you know, in choices and out choices by individual, by wave. Uh, it will give you statistics on the behavior variables. It will give you statistics on the change in the networks over time. And all of these things should be examined to make sure that there's nothing weird going on. In addition to the fact that it can be useful for uh, calculating statistics to put in papers and stuff later on. All right, so after the data object, now we need to create something called an effects object. I haven't told you what effects are, but basically effects are predictors. Um, the predictors will be based on all of the uh, endogenous or independent variables that you specify here. And so basically what this get effects function does is to take all of these variables that you gave it in the data object, notice that it references only the data object, and it creates what amounts to a table of all of the possible effects you could include in a model. So unlike an ordinary regression model, it's not as simple as you just you know, grab a variable or maybe you grab a variable and you transform it by a logarithm or do something like that. Um, <clears throat> because the formulas for effects are really functions of the variables. They're not the variables themselves. And we'll see why that is the case um, when we talk about effects a little further on, okay? But, so basically what this does is it transforms your variables into all of the possible, a, a set of all of the possible effects that you might include in the model. You can then look at those effects by running this function here. Um, get uh, the, the get, excuse me, down here, the effects documentation um, function, and that will give you. See if I can find it. Here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna open what the output that this creates. It's fobj one dot HTML, and I'm going to open it, and we're going to view it in the web browser, with any luck. It's kind of big, so it takes a minute to open. Drag it onto the screen here, it's on one of my other screens. Come on. It's a rendering, hang on. All right, so here you see this table. Each one of these rows represents an effect, a potential effect, that is a, predict, a potential predictor of something. Um, so what is it, what do they predict? Well, this name field here is basically the independent variable to which this other stuff here refers, uh, not independent, dependent variable, okay? So all of these effects here that have the name loan net zero SD um, are referred to effects that can predict uh, the loan net density. So this is um, this is for the, uh, the loan network, a willingness to loan money to people. Um, I don't want to go through these. I, I can't go through these any in any comprehensive way given the time. Uh, but some of these um, things that can affect the loan density network include rates, which are rates of change in the network. This is, these would be model based rates. Um, they include, um, here's our old friend, out degree, which is also known as density. So basically this is the number of um, one ties that exist in the network, uh, averaged over individuals. Reciprocity, right? These are the number of, um, this is a measure of uh, the extent to which somebody, to which I'm relatively more likely to pick somebody else to loan money to as somebody I'd be willing to loan money to if they pick me. 
and so forth. So that'll be enough of that for now. We'll talk about this some more later. But suffice to say that when you specify a model, what you're basically doing is you're picking out a set of rows from this table. So it's really a good idea to have a version of this thing, you know, sitting right there next to you. What I often do is I'll, I'll render this thing into a PDF using Adobe Acrobat. And I'll just keep that open as I'm working with, with my modeling. And that way, if I ever want to be sure about, if I ever need to make a reference to it to figure out how to pick one of these rows, then I'll know how to do it. So what about the row picking? Well, there are some functions that you can use for picking out each of these different rows. But the bottom line is that the sum total of um, values from name over to interaction type here will specify, can be used in combination to specify a specific row. You could also do the same thing by, by just writing bare knuckles R code, you know, to say pick something out of this object that has the name of blah and the effect name of blah two and the short name of blah three and so forth and so on. All, the sum total of all of these has to be unique, okay? So this is basically like a, um, a relational database table where every row has some way of uniquely identifying it. Um, and um, there's some commotion outside my, my door. My uh, granddaughter and, and uh, wife and dog just came back from their walk. So if you hear barking and things like that, it's, it's not me. Um, it's just the various other activities in my household. All right. Well, hello, Cooper. He just made the scene, and now he's lying in his bed over there. So that could be a uh, precursor to uh, more barking, or it might just everything might be peaceful. I don't know. We'll have to find out. All right. So um, in any case, uh, just to reiterate, a model is specified by picking out a set of these, a subset of these rows um, that are meaningful to the thing we want to model. And we'll talk more about um, next about how we do that and then about what it means. Okay, so I'm just going to minimize that for now. I've got a little blurb here for you to read in the script on the model. It kind of repeats things that I just talked about. And it also tells you why and how the specific model specification things um, that we use below are used. So here we go. In this, um, in this statement here, we use the Sienna model create function to actually create. And this is a little, a little bit um, misleading because what we're really doing here is we're creating the specifications for how to run the model and we're not really specifying it yet we haven't told it what effects to include there is an equivalent function called Sienna algorithm create which is exactly it's just a it's just a uh, an alias for Sienna, Sienna model create and it's actually more descriptive in some ways but I use Sienna model create for out of habit because that was the first name that was assigned to this function and I'm used to it. Um, when I do this, I give the project a name. That name will contain, a, will, it will specify a text file that will include where the output gets put, okay? And if I use the same name over and over again, the output will get stacked in that file, which is handy because, you know, often we run these things in sequence. We build up a model from simpler versions. So it's really nice to be able to go to just one place here and see the results. Um, then there's some other specifications here which um, we don't really need to talk about very much because it's in the text here. And you can just read about that. Um, most of them are completely standard with one exception. And that is this statement here, use standard inits, okay? Because Sienna is an iterative or uh, stochastic actor modeling uses an iterative algorithm to estimate it, we have to, as is typical with these things, give it start values. So what should the parameters be to start out with? If the parameters are too far off of where the true model parameters are, assuming the model is specified correctly, and let's assume that for the moment, um, 
the algorithm can wander around uh, lost in the wilderness for long periods of time and make the algorithm either not converge to uh, a, a good solution uh, at all or, or else take more time than it should to get there. Um, so typically what we do is uh, the program will calculate standard um, initial values. That's what standard inits are. Uh, and you should use that only the first time that you run the model. We use a forward selection process, meaning that we start with a simple model where those standard inits are, in, for, for a typical social network, are usually relatively accurate. I mean, it can depend. Uh, and there can be complications in which we'll talk about another time uh, because it's, it's too much to get into the nuts and bolts right now. There are ways you can kind of figure out better standard or better initial values and specify those instead of using the one the pro ones the program give you. But for right now, we'll assume that your first run is going to say use standard inits equals true. Okay. However, after their first run, you want to change that to false. Now, why is that? Because what you're going to do is you're going to use the parameters that were estimated from your previous run for all of the effects that were that you are carrying over from the previous model run to this one. Very typical forward selection procedure. And that works quite well. And usually you don't even have to bother with giving a um, uh, initial value for uh, a parameter you add, as long as you only add one or maybe two to your new run. And um, those, by the way, are set to zero to start out with, so it's nice and neutral. Uh, and th the model will usually estimate okay from there, only having to wander around in those two dimensions of the, uh, um, of the parameter space because it's already got a pretty good idea of where it has to be for the parameters that you've um, previously estimated, right? So first run, standard and it's true. Subsequent run, standard and it's false. Got it? All right, now we're gonna talk about how we add effects, that is to say predictors to the model. Um, oh, let me say one other thing first about the, um, which is really quite important here about the, um, the data object. Basically, the broad structure of the model is specified by the data object in terms of how many dependent or endogenous variables you include in it. So how many endogenous variables do we have here? Well, we have the network, the lone network in this case. Well, this is, okay. I, I, I showed you an example using a lone network, but this one actually is creating a friendship network. Okay, sorry for that confusion. But we have a network, and a network is always a dependent object in, um, uh, in our Sienna. And then we have the recovery factor, and the recovery factor, we might recall, is an endogenous behavior variable. That is to say, it's being predicted by aspects of individuals and um, of their position in the network. So what that means is that this particular stochastic actor model has two equations in it one for the network and one for the endogenous behavior variable. And it will have that structure no matter what else we do in the specification. So in that sense, the broad structure in terms of the predictive equations that it includes is set once you give it the data object. That's when you're deciding which variables are going to be used um, as, as dependent, okay? And then other specifications, um, we're going to talk about that right now. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, so we went through the model create, which as I said before, is really creating an algorithm that it's going to use. Now we're going to include effects. Okay, so before I get into the syntax of this, I want to talk a little bit about what an effect is and why you can't usually just take a plain old variable um, out of, uh, uh, you know, let's say a data frame or something like that and use that as a predictor. 
Uh, so for that, I'm going to call up a PowerPoint that I did um, last year. And uh, let's make this big. Oops. Sorry, what I want to do is let's do it this way. That'll be all right. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yeah, all right. So, basically, a model specification in, um, in R. Siena is a little different than an ordinary regression because where the network is the dependent variable, all right, you are trying to figure out what kinds of factors predict the formation and dissolution of ties. Uh, the data that is used to infer this, of course, is your empirical data, longitudinal empirical data, where you see, uh, where you get to see where a particular tie xij from individual i uh, to individual j changes or doesn't change. And um, of course, you know, individuals i and j have certain characteristics that could affect that probability. Um, there could be some relationship between them already that affects that. Like, you know, maybe they're friends and that helps them form up. If, if x is a lone network, maybe uh, their friendship uh, potentiates their becoming lone partners. Um, if uh, they are, um, if they have the same, um, well, I, well, I'll just go on from there and talk about that. I was about to start talking about into how individual characteristics might affect these, but that's really part of this discussion here. Okay, so if we're trying to predict the formation of network ties, one obvious issue here is going to be the general tendency to form ties overall. And so here we have a formula that is simply the sum over all possible alters of the ties that I could make with J. So let's suppose this is friendship. Well, I could pick um, everybody, all other J's, right, in, in his or her recovery home, or only some of them or very few of them. The average of these things, or the totals, depending on you know, how you want to look at it, um, is going to be given in a formula like this. And that will affect the general underlying tendency for tie formation. So you can think of the out degree effect as a little bit like an intercept in a regression model. It kind of gives a, a general tendency to form or not form ties. Another way to say that is it gives the um, uh, tendency for sparseness in the network. Um, another very important social network effect is called reciprocity. And, and that is uh, an index of the tendency for, if, if, uh, for an individual uh, that I choose. If I'm individual I and uh, I choose individual J as a friend, is there a tendency then for a friendship, for that friendship to be reciprocated to me, that J chooses me back? Okay, because remember these are directed networks here. You know, we use nominations from A to B as well as from B to A. And we infer that those uh, nominations have meaning, moreover. Um, so basically, you can think of it this way. If your data show a relatively high value for reciprocity, then there's going to be a higher tendency for individuals uh, for, for where a a dyad has a tie xij for there to be a reciprocal tie ji. And that would mean that, for example, if at time zero, I've chosen individual j, but he or she hasn't chosen me yet, <clears throat> there's a higher probability that that tie ji will be formed in the next time. Either that, or that I will drop my tie to j 
and so they'll both be zero. So the point is that this effect essentially predicts a tendency towards congruency in this particular network type of tie. And we know that it's a very, very typical, <clears throat> in fact, it's almost unheard of uh, that it would be otherwise for um, networks like friendships to, to not have a, a significant reciprocity effect. I'm gonna talk, by the way, about why these kinds of effects are important to include in your model in a second. Um, but let me just continue with the uh, uh, description of them. Another one is transitivity. John, yeah. did you say there's a tendency to not have reciprocity? I don't know. I'm sorry. The tendency, there is, the tendency is towards a reciprocity in friendship networks, oh, okay. Invari invariably. Okay. Okay. Really almost invariably. Um, about the only reason that this would not be the case would be in networks that had a great deal of um, hierarchy. But generally speaking, if you're dealing with peers, then reciprocity is typical. Now, transitivity is another very important effect here. Transit transitivity is the idea that if I choose individual I chooses individual H as a friend and individual H chooses individual J, then it is likely that a, that a tie from I to J will form eventually. So it's, um, and, and why would this happen? Well, it can happen for two basic reasons. One of which is that that uh, tie from I to H and H to J suggests that I, H and J all have something in common. And so that would have a tendency to increase the likelihood of the I to J tie, basically creating the bottom, uh, completing the bottom of the triangle, if you will. So you've got I to H, H to J, and then I to J. But another reason is that if I and H are friends and H and J are friends, there'll be a tendency for those three individuals to be brought in contact with each other. So I and J are more likely to be exposed to each other, and if you don't, if you're not exposed to somebody, you're not likely to become friends with them, right? So it's also a kind of a stand-in measure for uh, um, for proximity, and that can be very useful because oftentimes we have difficulty um, literally geographically determining whether people are proximic to each other, but we can take advantage of the fact that social proximity is in a lot of cases, at least as good as physical proximity and, um, and use the transitivity as a, uh, uh, a way to, to control for that. So having said all of these things, let me point out that although out degree reciprocity and transitivity are usually not effects that we care about substantively in this model, it's very important to include them because if we don't include them, we could end up looking at uh, including substantive effects, which actually are um, uh, functions of those three, out degree, reciprocity, and transitivity. And I would say of all of those, um, reciprocity and transitivity are the most substantively important because they basically control for tendencies for network tie formation that almost always exist independent of anything else that's going on. So if you haven't controlled for those things, you can never be sure that an effect based on, let's say, uh, an individual characteristic or something like that, isn't at least partly due to one of those effects. So it's like a typical multivariate model interpretation situation. We want to control for the effects that we know we're likely to be there, even if they're not of substantive importance, because they affect the way we um, interpret other more substantively interesting effects. So in that respect, it's exactly like a planar regression model, conceptually. Okay, so now let's move on to this. This is an important effect here, the same V effect. Well, let's suppose that V is some characteristic, like in my, um, uh, in our recovery house models, maybe uh, V is um, um, time in house, okay? It might be that people who have the same uh, length of stay, they've been in the house for similar amounts of time, are more likely to be friends. Why would that be? Well, maybe they've 
been in the house together for a really long time, which has given them, given them the opportunity to have contact with, with each other for a very long time. Um, it could also be that uh, they have, um, uh, during that time, developed a relationship culture, you know, a set of shared understandings, activities they do together, uh, and perhaps this is shared amongst a lot of the people who have been there for a long time. And that would give rise, potentially, to a situation where individuals are more likely to be friends if they've hung out together in the same house for a long time. And it might take a while for a newcomer in the recovery home to crack that um, cleat, if you will. Um, I just want to mention, by the way, I'm giving this as a hypothetical. The evidence from our study actually shows that this is not the case, which is a bit startling if you think about it, because your logical thought would be that, you know, people who have been in the house for a long time um, would be likely, more likely to be friends simply because of the amount of time they'd spent together relative to newcomers. But that's not the case. That's not what we see in the data. There's no real tendency for that. Um, Sounds like a marriage. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe they just get sick of each other, right? Um, my, our guess is that it probably has, has something to do with, uh, with a very fundamental way in which relationships operate in these houses. Um, that is to say that they're a means to an end for people. And that end is a shared goal of recovery. At least that's our hypothesis right now. We have more research to do on that, but um, yeah, otherwise in a normal, um, let's say a work network, you would really not expect this kind of a finding. I mean, almost certainly people who had been with this organization for a long time would be more likely to be friends than people who had not, right? But interestingly enough, in these recovery homes, that's not the case. Okay, but in any case, the effect is specified mathematically by, um, for an individual I, uh, for in two individuals IJ, um, by the, uh, uh, the sum of the people that I is in contact with, weighted by their similarity on the variable V, where similarity is calculated like this, okay? In other words, it's exactly what you think. If two people have the same value, then they're completely similar, and I has, the, this indicator variable, has the maximum value of one, and that number gets downweighted the further apart VI and VJ are, okay? So basically, this is an index that is large between I and J when I and J have the same value on V. And it's larger for individual I across as, as he or she has more other individuals J with whom he or she is similar, okay? So the idea is that if this index is big, does that predict a likelihood of I choosing J, okay? Or to put it another way, what would adding a friendship tie from I to J add to this index for individual I? Well, if VI equals VJ, it adds as much as it can. If, if they're maximally different, it adds nothing, okay? So you can see how basically um, the idea of an effect is, if that effect is, effect is um, empirically relatively large in your data, then net of all other effects, it seems likely that you're going to find that it's predictive of tie formation. If it's less than you would expect, then it might be, um, uh, it might actually um, inhibit tie formation, okay? So in a way, these effects can be thought of as plain old independent variables. You know, if they have a big value um, on a regular basis when a tie forms, then that's an indication that they're associated with tie formation. Um, if they're around zero, they're not gonna be predictive. If they're negative, um, and they're going to be uh, uh, predictive of uh, tie inhibition, if you will. Okay, so that's a very quick into 
uh, introduction to um, ties or effects that we use for predicting network tie formation. Um, I can get there. The, the, really the best thing for you to do if you want to know more about this is to read up on stochastic actor modeling generally using one of the references available on uh, the Oxford RCNA website. But if you have any immediate questions about this right now, I'd be happy to address them. One more comment is just that you can see why when you're predicting network ties, you can't just grab a variable off the shelf as a general rule, because that variable really has to be transformed into something that's relevant in a network situation. And since this is a model about tie formation, it's necessarily a model about relationships between particular individuals in your network, or basically all dyads is the way I'd like to put that. Um, so you need to have predictors that are dyad level predictors. And in effect, what happened, what the effects objects does is it creates a set of effects based upon your network and your predictor variables, which are relevant to predicting dyad tides. So John, how many these can you have in a model? You can have as many as you want. You can have all the effects that are in a, um, uh, an effects object, any and all of them, except that just like with any other model, you run out of degrees of freedom. That is to say that you have, you know, your parameter space is bigger than your observation space. <laughs> and so you won't be able to get any kind of um, reasonable statistical estimation because that's always based on um, uh, the extent to which unique values of predictors when taken together match up with the data, roughly speaking. So you always are gonna to have to have far fewer parameters than you have data. And that's actually a problem for us because you know our networks are all constrained. We have 627 individuals in our um, uh, six wave database. And that sounds like a lot of data, but it's not like 627 um, squared possible dyads. Why? Because the friendship networks, loan networks, advice networks are all within homes and you can't have a tie between homes. And so that's going to cut out most of the possible ties that you could have otherwise had if this was a complete 627 by 627 network. Right? So we have to be quite stingy about the effects that we include and um, and to be cagey about the theoretical bases that we use for including them um, because otherwise because unfortunately you can't just throw everything but the kitchen sink into a model and expect to get anything intelligible so does that make sense Lenny? Yeah where would um if you had a dyadic level predictor, so it looks like in here on your slide, V is an individual level predictor. It could be different for individual I versus J. Yep. But if, if you had a dyadic level predictor like I and J. Well, one that I often use, uh, and not in, in these, it's not relevant here because the houses are all same gender, but like in the adolescent networks that we look at, same sex is a big one. And same sex is a dyadic predictor, right? Um, same sex, yeah. But it, I, w I would say- It applies to a tie, right? I and J uh, have, can, imagine I and J have an edge between them. And that edge can have a same sex property to it. And it's a zero one property. So it's, you, you define the tie as, um, we have to be the same sex in order for it to be a tie? Correct. And you can calculate the, um, the same sex um, uh, effect as simply being the, um, uh, you know, the sum over all of your ties of individuals for whom you share a same sex edge. Okay, so that's different than 
the example you have in there for same V? Well, it actually turns out that those two effects are the same. Okay, okay. So there, there is, you can actually specify the effect as a, that kind of an effect as being either based on an individual characteristic that two people share, or as a so-called dyadic covariant, which is a property of the edge. Uh, maybe a better example of something that can't be a property of the two individuals would be something like um, the distance between their homes. Now, obviously, again, that's not relevant for recovery homes because they all live in the same place. But you could, if you wanted to, measure the distance from the bedroom where this guy sleeps to the bedroom where that guy sleeps and use that as a distance thing. Because, you know, it would be, there's actually precedent for that in, in some studies from the 50s where they looked at uh, student housing at MIT and discovered, lo and behold, that people were more likely to be friends if they lived physically closer to each other. Okay. So um, that's, an, that's an example of a pure dyadic covariate because obviously the distance from me to you is not a property of me or of you. It's a property of both of us. You know? So that would be an example of a purely dyadic covariate. And those can be included in, in these models too. I didn't give you any examples here just because, you know, because of space. I don't think I did anyway. John, I, um, I'm Jacob First. I'm a, I work with Lenny um, on CFS projects mostly, but he invited me in to hear about your presentation. Welcome, Thank you. Jacob. Okay. Thank you. It was really, really nice. Um, and I'm going to ask, I think, some fairly novice questions, so please excuse no me. No problem. Every, um, they'll, they'll be useful for everybody. <laughs> so my, my understanding my high level understanding here is that you're, you're making some sort of a, a predictive model, but right. not only are you using these sort of directly measured effects like age and sex and gender, but mm -hmm. you're also using um, uh, effects that come from the, the network model that right. is set up based on these effects. Yep. Okay. All right. That's really awesome, by the way. I think that's a really can, fascinating. Can I, can I just interject a comment here? Sure, because please. this might anticipate what you're about to say. Just bear in mind that those network effects are, are measured too, because we measure the networks. So these effects here are basically, as with any other model, you're, you basically end up comparing the theoretical predictions based upon a model-based evolution of the network to the actual evolution of the network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I sort of understood that at a somewhat intuitive level. Awesome. Uh, but your ex your explanation is helpful, right? Okay. They are measured effects, yes. So it's um, all data. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I also really appreciate you you mentioning the problem with having too many parameters for the number of cases. So that's mm -hmm. that's something that shows up in my work a lot. And so I, I'm uh -huh. glad you mentioned that because I, I may not have been looking for it. Right. Um, and then the other question, I, I wasn't quite sure. Uh, you 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 said that the the network effects are only dyadic? No. Um, okay, I misheard that then, I'm sorry. To clarify, uh, network effects can involve a characteristic of the person doing the choosing, a characteristic of the person being chosen, or a characteristic that logically only makes sense um, to talk about if you're referring to the potential link between them. So the example that I gave of distance between two people, now let's suppose we have a community network, okay? And we have everybody's address and we have some kind of a way of calculating the city block metric distance from everybody's front door to, between all pairs of front doors, okay? That would be an example of a dyadic um, measurement, which has no meaning whatsoever for an individual, okay? I mean, you know, I don't have a distance because my distance has to be relative to something else. But it does make sense for me to talk about my, my uh, uh, the, the distance from my front door to my neighbor, Mr. Jones's front door, or something like that. So that would be an example of what we call a dyadic covariate. And you may think of that as a property of a dyad, of, of a potential link between two individuals. And sure. that's the only way that it makes sense. On the other hand, uh, my age is, you know, a, a useful, uh, maybe a useful measurement uh, 
and maybe relevant to whether Mr. Jones and I are friends, independent of anything else. Maybe older people are less likely to make friendship choices, for example. So that would mean that I'm less likely to choose Mr. Jones as a friend just because I'm old and I just don't make a lot of friendship choices. See what I mean? Maybe younger people like Mr. Jones are really busy because they have families and stuff like that. And so they're not receptive to choices that, that are made from others as, as a general rule. They're very choosy. And so that would suggest that, you know, Mr. Jones being younger uh, makes him a less attractive candidate as a friend, or he's less likely to um, uh, become involved in friendships. Uh, uh, to, he's less likely to be nominated by others as a friend um, because he's less available, basically. And so those would be example, examples of how an individual characteristic might affect uh, the likelihood of a friendship forming or not forming. And those are just individual characteristics. So by the way, was, go ahead. I was thinking, so in some previous analysis that Lenny and I did, and keep in mind these were on, on proteins, not people. Um, right. But one of the things that we, we looked at in the network was sort of um, uh, uh, measurements like central. Uh, so, so more complex than just out degree, right? Because you're taking into account the out degree, the in degree, um, how central a particular node is in the network. And how so do I you measure like centrality? Are, yeah. So, so are yeah. these things that you could also use as network effects? D depends. How did you measure centrality? You know what, John? I don't remember. <laughs> okay. It's been a few years. And <laughs> no, that's um, fine. That's fine. Conceptually, there's a lot. There are a lot of different ways to think about centrality. Um, <clears throat> but one thing about this type of, of um, model is that it is not oriented towards a tendency for the network to move towards a particular type of broad structure, okay? Ah. So you don't have a parameter in here that um, that you explicitly include that involves centrality. However, and, and, and in fact, one of the reasons that it's called actor oriented is because the idea is that you're trying to model something like decision making where people choose others to be in that network relationship with them. And that relationship may be reciprocated or not. It may become transitive or not, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very, you know, individual and dyadically oriented. And so centrality would be an epiphenomenon. It would be an emergent characteristic of the network. It would not right. be something that you explicitly include in the model. Now that may or may not be considered to be interesting, but if you're interested in um, trying to model the um, dyad level mechanisms, if that's meaningful for your modeling, it can be really cool because that not only provides a way to figure out whether a network is moving towards centrality, but it also gives you an explanation for why it did. So that's the idea of the model. Make sense? Yeah, no, no, that's great. Great and question, by the way. I, I mean, that's a really fundamental thing about these models. And, um, uh, th th there's there's another class of model, by the way, called um, an exponential random graph model or ERGM. Those models are more oriented towards um, structural features. So does the model tend to move towards a structure that has a lot of um, clusters in it or a lot of stars in it or a lot of, you know, four cycles in it, you know, or what have you, different structural features. And that kind of a model is more suitable for, you um, answering directly including uh, you know predictors of a particular kind of structure awesome John, okay. I'm sorry I have to leave I have a, a another meeting at noon that I need to prepare for thank you so much for this presentation it was wonderful oh you're welcome and uh, thank for, you for answering the questions for dropping by all right so John in one of our earlier papers we actually looked at centrality in um, the recovery homes. Right. So if we wanted to build on, on some of those findings, could we bring some of that into um, our Siena? Well, I think that's an interesting question and probably 
a deeper one that we can really spend much time on right now. Um, my general comment would be, following on, on um, Jason's uh, question, that we would predict that networks would tend or not tend to centralize as a function of certain other features that they might have. Um, but we would not use centrality per se as a predictor. Instead of that, what we would probably do is we would simulate the model and we would see whether the simulation is tended to give rise to increasingly centralized networks, for example. What do you mean by centralized network? Well, again, centralized is, uh, you know, is a very general term, um, but uh, probably in our context, it would tend to mean that um, something like, well, the friendship network uh, was centralized around, you know, one or two important central individuals. So everybody chose them, they chose everybody else, and the other people might or might not choose each other. That kind of an idea. So, so John, it would seem like we should be able to capture that. Um, wouldn't we be able to do so? I, what do you mean by capture? Well, we could, yeah, I mean, we could certainly, as I said, the way I would think about this is that, you know, there would be mechanisms that were changing the network. And we would see whether those networks gave rise to a more centralized network if we simulated it over time. So there's a simulation thing. Um, when you simulate it, you get basically a sequence of networks that are changing according to the model dynamics over time. You know, somewhat, um, some of that is, uh, there, there's a, um, a deterministic component to that evolution and a stochastic component. Um, but on average, you should see a, if you graphed, you know, the, you know, time over network centrality, you see a line that kind of wanders upward like that uh, as, you know, simulation time, if you will, goes on. So that is how we would figure out whether the mechanisms that we had included in our model led to increased center centralization or not. And the cool thing about that, to reiterate, is that if we did find that, it would um, not only be an indication of the phenomenon, it would also provide an explanation for why it occurs, namely as a result of the different effects on the model. Are we talking about the same thing? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Well, listen, we're kind of running out of time here. Um, so what we should do is take this up again on Friday, right? That, that's great. Friday, um, we will continue and it'll be one o'clock central time. Um, yeah. And that's 11 o'clock your time. Yeah. Just to give a little um, um prelude for things to come here, I will start by talking about how we add the kinds of effects I just mentioned to the model using the syntax here. And you might want to look at that in the run our Sienna model script in the, in the repo. Um, and you, you basically include them by using the include effects function. Um, and then there's a few other details and that's pretty much it. Then you just run the model. So we don't have too much more to do here. Um, and uh, I hope everybody is uh, finding this somewhat useful. And if you have any questions, problems, issues, what have you, please do let me know, okay? And, and John, this is extremely helpful. And over the next couple of days, we'll have a chance to do some experimenting with this and then we can bring that into you on Friday to get your thoughts. That would be great. I mean, it, it, you know, the proof of this is all going to be in, you know, people getting, starting to look at some models and, Know, thinking of, or thinking about how they want to specify them and be, and you know either trying it or running into a brick wall and then you know asking a question and then we, we get rid of the brick wall and off we go um, but it only takes a couple of iterations like that before you start to get the idea and be patient with yourselves too because this kind of modeling is weirdly familiar if you're in a, if you know about general multivariate modeling but also weirdly unfamiliar. And you can really, <laughs> I, I at least, you know, when I first started doing it, um, found, found that it could be quite confusing. 
at times. And even now, sometimes, you know, I, I find myself drifting off the, uh, um, the correct path. So, you know, it takes a little time. Hey, John, you're right on the central path for us. So thank you. Doing my best. What can I say? Thanks all for listening and um, we'll see you Friday. Sounds good. Okay. Great. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.